you want this snog at this here, bro? Okay. We'll use this one. Let's hear the church say hallelujah. 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 I'm going to start this out in prayer. Father, that I pray that I decrease while you increase. Holy Spirit, have your way. Come upon us and bring forth the message that you would have your family to hear, Father. Father, your spirit, the Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We welcome you and we pull on you. We pull on the anointing. And we pull on you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. And thank you for this privilege to use us as your tools, Father. Use us now to glorify your name, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Matthew 25, 36. For I was in prison, and you came to visit me. The title of my sermon is Tales from the Cells. Amen? Amen. Tales from the Cells. Tales from the Cells. T-A-L-E-S. From the cell, C E L L S. Before I begin this, I would like to open up with the, the Lord's Prayer because I'm going to utilize that here in a little while. Whose Father? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And amen. Tales from the cells. First, I'm going to start out with a gentleman named Pop Taylor. Pop Taylor's real name is James Taylor. And he's from Springfield, Jacksonville, Florida. Anybody in here pretty well knows where Springfield is. A lot of time ministering in the prisons, they don't know what it is. Pop Taylor's nickname was Scruffy. And he'd go around all the time and he'd say, Gayer, he said, how about short me up on that rib? Because I used to smoke back then. And there were rips were uh, roll your own cigarettes. I don't know if y'all know, you know, we called them duty dudes, beer glores, kites. And he'd say, short me up on that rib there, Gayer. Or hey, has anybody got a cup of mud? He was quite a character, and I'm talking about mud, I'm talking about coffee, you know. Well, we, he was a, he, Pop Taylor was, goodness, I believe he was in his 70s. And he'd lived a hard life on the streets. And Pop Taylor went to a, a chapel service one Wednesday night at Putnam. And he was in there, and we was all kind of astonished that Pop Taylor went to chapel to begin with, because we'd never seen him there, you know. It was like, wow, look at there, hey man, Pop Taylor's there, and the roots still up. That's pretty good. Hey, you know, construction of this building is pretty good. Well, unbeknown to us, that Pop Teddo is going to accept Christ that night. And I'm sorry if I get teared up because it means a lot to me to see these guys. These are brothers in Christ that God had touched their lives. Each man I want to talk about today. Pop Teller said the sinner's prayer and accepted Christ. And we're all rejoicing. Tell my man, can you believe that? Pop Teller accepted Jesus tonight? Wow, praise God. Miracles do happen. You know, we're rejoicing. The next morning at 8 o'clock, Pop Teller had a massive heart attack and dropped dead. It's like God waited for him all these years. All these years. And he come home. He says, welcome home, my son. You're with me today. That man went from a man-made hell to God's paradise and heaven and him in one heartbeat. And he was gone. And we were sad, but we were rejoicing that Pop Taylor went home. He wouldn't even save hardly eight hours. But it goes to tell you, behold, a knock on the door. You know, it's in Revelation 1, 320. Behold, a knock on the door. If you open the door, I will come in and sup with you and you with me. We don't know the time. We don't know the hour. You know, like this morning, I, we, Kim and I could have got hurt this morning just backing out of our driveway, going to church. Something innocent, but could have been so, you know, tragic. The next brother I'm going to talk about, and I'm not going to mention his last name because I don't want to put his, his business in the streets. His name, I'm going to name him Jack, and he's from Jacksonville, North Shore. Another homeboy. I ministered to Jack, and I tried to talk to Jack about Jesus. And Jack says, Gator, I don't need all that Jesus stuff. I'm a real man. 
taste of that chap over there is full of full of punks and snitches and whoever's you know them hypocrites them are for weak people I don't need no Jesus you need to respect that it's okay Jack I respect I'm praying for you but I, I, I respect you know that you don't need Jesus but I don't agree and I left it at that I respected him sad fact is Jack got out and Jack committed suicide he blowed his brains out with a SWAT team around his trailer I don't know if Jack said a prayer before he left or not I know he was witness to because I witnessed to Jack that's a sad that's one of the sad ones I had another brother named Manny Vallier does anybody know the name Manny Vallier Manny Vallier was a cop killer. He killed two cops in Miami. I'm sorry. I need a tissue. My nose is about to run down my face. Excuse me. Manny was on death row. And Brother Jim Brissy and I... Excuse me. We would just stop doing visits. But we prayed beforehand, God, lead us where you would have us to go. Prepare the souls that you would have us to minister to. And we end up at this, this gentleman's name, Manny Vallier, his cell. And Jim asked him, says, Manny, if you died today, do you know when you know her that you'd be in heaven with Jesus? Manny looked at him and says, no, Jim, I really don't know. I hope so. Jim says, you don't have to hope so. We can know so. We can sell this today if you choose to. He said, well, I'd like to do that. So Jim and I led Manny through the, through the sinner's prayer, holding his hands through the bars. And as we was holding his hands and he was saying the sinner's prayers, tears were flowing down his cheeks as he confessed that he was a sinner, that he needed a Savior, and that he believed that Jesus was the Son of God, that he died for him on that cross. And accept him in, and called him and accept him in his heart. No sooner we finished praying, Jim asked, says, Manny, do you have a Bible? Manny says, No, Jim, I don't have a Bible. And about that time, the wing door pops open. Boom! Yow! And this man sticks his head through the door and says, Hey, does anybody need a Bible? <laughs> man, I get all excited. I mean, it's like right on cue on time, man. We're running down the yeah, yeah. And, and I look at this guy and I'm like, Dude, Al Paquette. A little story about Al Paquette. Al Paquette, does anybody know what a one percenter is? Anybody know what a one percenter is? Yes, No, sir. One percenter is the one percent of the baddest of the baddest of the outlaws. Motorcycle game. He was a one percenter. He fought in a bad man contest in Orlando. He was by the Rolly standards, he was a mean dude. But Christ had changed that man's heart. And I met Manny Valle on Kairos Fort, Tomoka. I mean, excuse me, not Manny. Al Paquette. I met Al during Kairos Fort. And I looked down and I said, Al, it's Gator, dude. Gator. Kairos Fort, Tomoka. He said, oh, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Al was excited because he knew that his, his labors wasn't in vain. Here it is. He's on death row meeting one of the brothers that he ministered to 10 years ago. He's all excited. He's what you want. I got NIV. I got King James. I got New King James. I says, I says, I don't know, bro. What you say? And he says, Here, just take one of these. Here's two or three. You know. <laughs> so we go back down, and I, got, I think it was an NIV, and we presented it to Manny. And, says, and Jim says, Manny, you need to start reading in John. Just read John. Be Christian means Christ-like. So just start falling in the steps of Christ. Read John. And Manny did. Long story short, Manny was executed. The state of Florida carried out, and I have no, no really no problems with it, but then again, I, I deserved it myself. Manny died looking up to heaven. They asked Manny, you know, a lot of times they give him um, 
uh, I want to say incentives. Anyway, medicine to calm him down. Manny denied it. He was totally at peace. He says, I'm going home. I'm going home. He was so excited. I've never seen a guy excited about dying. But he had peace. He had peace in his heart that we can't comprehend. That's right. That's right. Because he had seen his Savior. And he knew just on the other side of one breath that he was going to be with Jesus. That day that they executed Manny, Jim was with Manny and his family. With Manny's fam family. I wasn't allowed to be there because I wasn't his pastor. I was with at the, um, the media tent. And those officers, and this is a sad fact, but those officers, families were there. And one of the officer's daughters was sitting there and you spewing the hate. You could feel it. It was like, you know, vapor coming out of her. And I'm like, oh, Lord Jesus. And I started praying for her because I come to the realization that here it is. This woman's been done wrong. She's got right to really hate this man. But what did God say? What did God say? I said, I was sad because this woman, even though she'd been done so wrong, here it is, you got a convicted cop killer, he's going to heaven, and you got the family that's in danger of hell's fire for unforgiveness. Oh, it was sad, and it broke my heart. I mean, they would have done so wrong, but yet, then again, they need, they need Jesus. The world needs Jesus. So Manny Valle died a convicted felon. And he went home to be with the Lord because of the simple act of faith in Christ. I had another brother. We called him Big Bob. His real name was Patrick Evans or Bob Evans. You know, we called him, yeah, Robert Evans. We called him Big Bob. I ministered to Big Bob, and, you know, <laughs> about accepting Christ in his life. And he's, he's like, Jack says, man, I don't need Jesus. That's for you, Gator. You're okay. You're, you've changed. I can see the change in your life. I'm not worried about you hitting me in my mouth no more or taking my stuff. He says, you know, praise God. I praise God for you, man. He says, you accepted Christ in your life. You're, that's good for you. But I ain't like you, man. <laughs> you know, all that Jesus stuff. I don't know about all that Jesus stuff. Well, Bob gets out, and him and I stay in contact because we have a common grounds, which was, was Mustangs. And he lived in Tampa, Clearwater area. So at that time, I was traveling the state, and I continued to, to minister to Bob. Well, Bob didn't really mind me every once in a while minister to him a little bit about Jesus, but he would kind of shut me down. But there's one thing about it. I like what Brother Jim says, Pastor Jim says, you know, you minister all the time, and sometimes you use words. And that's what David and I, my brother, David and I did. We loved Bob. And even Bob himself would sit there and says, you know, they're blessed. Because we had gotten a good deal at the swap meet, at the, the Mustang races. And this guy's like, man, you're always getting these good deals. How's that? And Bob looks up, oh, he's blessed. God blesses him, man. Even though he was a heathen, he knew that God was moving in, in my life. You know, well, Bob, Bob got in trouble again. And he went back. He he was he run chop shops. That's why he done all his life. He was a he was a booster, a car thief. He'd boost cars. Well, he went back to what he knows and he got caught, and uh, he went back to prison. So I got on his visitation list and I'd go visit to him and minister to him. I just what I felt led to do. So I continued ministering to Bob. And Bob, I get a letter from Bob, and says, he says, man, he says, look, bro, he says, things don't look too good. He says, uh, they found a spot on my mouth. They're going to send me back to Butler, which is the medical center in Lake Butler. He says, they want to check it out. So he says, I'll let you know what I find out. So he writes me back and says, man, they found cancer in my mouth. He says, that ain't right. He says, I've never smoked, chewed, or nothing in my life. Yet I got mouth cancer? I said, well, Bob... I don't know about that. But I do know that Jesus loves you. And he's concerned about you. Because that's why David and I continue to minister to you. Because God won't leave us alone about you. And we're being obedient to what God wants us to do. Long story short with Bob. I was blessed to lead Bob in the visiting part to Christ. 
and Bob started doing, you see, when you see me bringing that, that big old NIV Bible that I got, the real big thick one, that was Bob's. That was Bob's Bible. It was special to me. And I was blessed to get it back. They took all the stuff except that Bible. And that proper room officer says, you sent him that Bible, didn't you? And I'm like, yes, sir. My brother and I did. He said, I want you to have that Bible. And they, and they gave me that Bible. Everything else, basically, didn't really matter, but I got that Bible. And I sit there and I think about it. It took Bob and dying in prison with mouth cancer before he would let go and let God into his life. I was like, man, that's kind of that's hard reality there. You know? But how many people do we know that's had cancer or tragic things happen in our life before we look up? The next inmate I'm going to talk about is, is a guy named Gator. The pastor and his wife said he was a hellion. People in the neighborhood didn't like him. And sure enough, he lived up to his name. He got in trouble. But during that time when he was in trouble, he was seeking God. Then he'd run from God because he was in such a turmoil. And then he got locked up in confinement. And he was about 16 years deep on a, on a homicide murder charge. And he was so full of hate, belligerent, defiant. Prison's a hate factory. And they teach a lot, teach and breed a lot of hate and animosity in the systems. They teach a lot of racial interventions because they'll do something for the blacks that they won't do for the whites. And they make it kind of known. So they want to drive the wedges. Because they know if we ever come together as one, they can't control us. How in the world is 30 people going to control, you know, uh, seven or 800 men? They're not going to be able to. So there never is, there never is unity. So Gator gets locked up in the box. He's in the box, and you know, you often hear God's love. God is love. He's the author of love. Well, Gator's me. And when I was in confinement, God started loving on me and started dealing with me. And I thrashed with God. I told God, I said, God, you got a good talk game that you love me. I got the verses wrote down. The first one is John 3, 16. You know, we all know it by heart. We just, probably one of the first verses. Probably Sister Debbie's the one that learned it to me when I was a, a, a youth at Dunn's Creek Baptist Church. You know, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whom should ever should believe in Him, whom should ever shall believe in Him, shall not perish but have everlasting life. And I said, that's a good talk game there, God. And I said, but where was you at when my father died? I didn't even really realize at the time that the Holy Spirit pointed out to me that I was ticked off at God for my daddy dying. Of course, then again, those of you who knew my daddy, my daddy was 300 pounds, strong as an ox. I remember when we'd go to like up spawn feeds and get sacks feed, he'd grab 200 100 pound sacks of feed and throw them over his shoulders, carry them, put them in the car. And I was just a little youth, and you know, a 50 pound sack of laying mash about to kill me, and he towed 200 pounds. That man went from being a bull of 300 pounds to 150 pounds dead and gone six months in the grave. He died of pancreatic cancer. And I cried because I had been to, I had seen God move so mildly as a child. I went to the Catherine Kuhlman crusade. And I seen the miracles happen. My mother was one. She was slain in the spirit right there at the old civic auditorium and she fell backward. Boom! On that concrete. And I knew. It sounded like her head busted up like a watermelon. And I ran and grabbed her. There was no bump, no lump, no blood, nothing. And she was laid back still praying in the spirit. I'm like, oh, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hey, Mom, you need to get up. <laughs> you know, I was a child. But I seen God move. And I knew he was a miracle-making God. He loved her. And I cried for my father. But yeah, he died. I says, God, where was you at then? He said, son, in that small voice, he said, son, I did heal him. He said, I healed him complete and whole. He said, I loved him so much, I carried him to be home with me in paradise, and I gave him a new body. I started chewing on that. I'm like, okay, Lord, cool, that, that. All right. Where was you at when Vera died? I didn't realize it at the time, but the Holy Spirit was bringing up all this infection in me. He was ripping off the scabs of my heart. 
And as the Holy Spirit would bring them up, He'd cleanse them out, and we'd thrash, and we got them out for seven days. God started healing my heart. And finally, I just started crying out to God, and I let go, and I accepted Christ for real. Got real with God. I almost missed heaven by 18 inches. I had a head knowledge. I could spit scriptures out with the best of them, but I didn't have that heart knowledge. I didn't have that intimacy with Jesus Christ. There's the difference. Head to heart, 18 inches. I accepted Christ in there, and God started trying, changing my life miraculously. I could just go on and on and on telling you about the miracles God has done for me, moving mountains in my life. I was 16 years deep in there. I turned around and sent my post-conviction home, all my legal work home. I was free. God had set me free. And I just started praising God. That's all I wanted to do was just praise God. They had me working on the, the city squads outside, and I'd sit there, and I'd preach, and I'd sing to that lawnmower. I knew that lawnmower was saved. It had to be. <laughs> because I would just praise and rejoice God as I was sitting there cutting the grass in those cities, in the city of Palatka, in St. Augustine. And God moved so miraculously in my life. But Satan kept messing with me. And I was having problems dealing with my crime. Because I hate my crime. I hated my time. I hated myself. You know? And I had to come to the realization that I had to truly believe and trust God for who He is and what He said He was. And trust His Word. So, you know, you're reading your Bible. So, okay, let, let's, let's research. Let's check this out. Some of the verses that really come to and just just really made themselves alive to me was the first one was Romans 5 8. I like to read the whole thing, so I'm going to turn to this Bible. Matter of fact, if you see me turn to this Bible, I want I want to show you something in this Bible. I don't want to lose my spot in there, but this Bible, this Bible right here belonged to Vera's mother. The young lady that that I ended up taking her life. That's a God thing. That when Mr. and Ms. Baker passed away, Bert was clean. I didn't talk much about Bert yet. But he was a gentleman that swore on his sister's grave that he was going to kill me. The day he gets out is the day I kill him. I get revenge. That's the same gentleman that gave me this Bible. There's only one way you can explain that kind of love and that kind of forgiveness. God. That's a God thing. Romans 5.8 But God shows His love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I'm sitting there and I'm thinking about that. Christ died for me when I was still a hellion, when I was kicking the screen out at the store. You know, I think about, wow. I saw him do that one day. You know, I was saying like, Lord, why, why would you do that? Why? Because he loves me. Because he loves you. The next scripture I like to go to First John 1 9. I really don't want to mess the flow up here. But I want to share these scriptures with you because they meant so much to me. They still do. I'm just going to go over this by memory. And yet while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It was 5 8, right? First John 1 9. God told us that if we confess our sins, that He is faithful and just to cleanse us and deliver us from all unrighteousness. From all unrighteousness. And I was like, oh, Lord Jesus. And then, of course, I, I continue to stand on Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ is same yesterday, today, and yes. forever. And God forgave me of all of my sins, and nothing changes. Yes. So the same things we were dealing with back then, it hasn't changed. God has forgiven me. 
and I, speak, I spoke of Bert. Bert swore on his, his sister's grave that he's going to kill me. Bert, God healed Bert's heart. And Bert and I now we go around and spread the gospel about forgiveness. We spoke here before. And just to give you a little thing how God has moved, He's opened up doors. We've been on international TV. We've been on the 700 Club, uh, the Catholic Channel Radio. And God has just moved mighty, mighty mountains. I had to get real with God and take God at His word, what He actually said in His word. And He said He's moved mighty, mighty mountains. He's blessed me with a good church. He's blessed me. I mean, another witness of God's love and His mercy is Kim. Because right before I got out, I started praying for a mate. I did not want to. I wanted a family. And God blessed me with a family. But who in their right mind would want to marry somebody that killed his ex-wife? God had to work a miracle in that. And He did. And He gave Kim confirmation that He had changed my heart. He had changed my life. And I thank God for that. I'm going to close with this before I have Kim come up. I spoke to the brothers on the inside, and some of them's hearts were pretty hard. Some of them were dealing with forgiveness. I don't know what your situation is today. You know, you might have a problem forgiving yourself. That was what my issue was. I was having the hardest problem forgiving myself. It was easier to accept God's forgiveness than it was to accept my own forgiveness for what I had done by my own hands. I don't know what your situation is, but I know God can heal it. And He can remove it, and He can heal your heart. So it leaves me with one question. You hear me mention it, these brothers and how God changed their lives, the ones that would let them. So I ask you this. How hard is your heart? What's it going to take? Kim? So I wanted to give a few testimonies of some things that God's done in my life and uh, miracles that he's done, confirmations, different things like that. But also uh, the thing that helped me come close to the Lord and to be able to hear his voice, to get these confirmations and to bring me through the hardest times. And just like with James, he didn't talk about it a lot, but it's worship, worship praise and worship it brings you through and that's that is the real um, our testimonies encourage you but it also encourages us it reminds us of the things that God's brought us through it reminds us that he is still on the throne he is still in control as long as we give him control we can take control if we want it so you got to remember that you have to give it to him but praise and worship will bring you through the darkness, the hard times, the tough times, the battle. The battle, if we give it to Him, the battle is not ours, but His, and He will bring us through. And if we let Him take control of it, we come through so much better on the other side than we could even imagine. And, and we can't win a battle uh, our, on our own. We just can't. And so the things that um, God has done in, in my life, um, a lot of you who've been here all these years know that I went through a divorce. I actually got married in this church twice, <laughs> praise the Lord. <laughs> and so um, my, I went through a divorce. Um, God just, uh, some, I want to kind of back up because I want to start with some of the first miracles I saw. Uh, I, we came here, I had a relationship with the Lord, I backslid for a number of years, started going through a divorce um, and rededicated my life. And I called Pastor Lyle the night that, I, or the day be, after I rededicated my life and I said, uh, and I hadn't talked to them in 10 years probably, I ran into them a couple places and I said, I rededicated my life first and I said, but I don't feel any different. I, I don't feel anything different. but. I prayed and asked the Lord to forgive me. And he quoted 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It doesn't matter how you feel. It's not about a feeling. Feelings have nothing to do with it. Forgiveness, 
is a choice. It has nothing to do with how you feel. If you continue to forgive, you continue to walk out that forgiveness, the feelings will eventually come around. The feelings have to conform to the Word of God. Everything has to conform to the Word of God. And so it, it's a process. You, you keep walking it out, going through it. Jesus said that we wouldn't, you know, he didn't say we wouldn't go through things, but he said we wouldn't go alone. And you can't do any better than having Jesus with you. And he will bring you through it. But one of the first um, things that the Lord did for me right up front was uh, rededicate my life, started coming to church, and um, I had leased a vehicle only a week before my husband left. And so, I, you know, I have my income and two girls to raise and bills and things, and so I, I want to thank Pastor Lyle and Jean, Susan, and um, Wayne and Janice, everybody who was here and Hubert, everybody that prayed for us and was with us, Brother Ricky and Miss Debbie, they know they were right there with me when I was going through it. They saw all these things, but every time God conquered these problems through faith, through fasting, through standing together, and that's what you, your church family is. We come together, there's strength, we pray for one another, we encourage one another, we hold up each other's arms when the battle's going on. Okay? And so that's what we're here for. But one of the first things uh, is that lease. I was like, I got this lease, I got this monthly payment that I'm going to have to pay and anything. Anyway, so I had traded in, I had a, an Explorer and I didn't owe a whole lot more on it. And I traded it in and got into a lease for some dumb reason. But anyway, uh, so uh, after four weeks of it, I was already over my mileage on the lease. I called Pastor Lyle I'm like, they're calling me in, they want me to come and sign new papers, but I don't want to do wrong because I am trying to do what God would have me to do no matter what the consequences. I'm going to do what God wants me to do. I don't want to be out of His will or His word. I don't want to you know, do anything wrong. And I pray, we prayed about this lease situation. They called me in and said, something was wrong with those first papers you signed. We need you to come back in and sign uh, new papers. And I'm like, should I go sign new papers? I don't want to sign new papers. I don't, want to, I don't even want the car. <laughs> so anyway, I went in, and, or I didn't go in, and I said, no, I'm not, I'm not coming back up there. If that contract that you have is not good, then I'll bring you the vehicle back. And so God got me out of that lease. And this is, the, this is how it was a miracle. It was because this is the only complication to the original papers. And I don't know why I'm spending so much time on this one little thing, but it must be going to reach somebody. When we signed the papers, I wanted my payments to be paid on the 10th of the month because that worked better for uh, the way our pay, our pay that came in. And so when capital or whatever got the papers no it their requirement was the payment was on the first of the month now how many companies are going to co cancel a contract over a payment date they had me on the hook for thirty two thousand dollars or something like that some big crazy lease so anyway god dropped that um he brought me through the divorce with everything if I had said, I want this, 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 I want it all out like this and everything like that, that's what I got. That was God. Two years, I waited, I prayed, I went through the motions, uh, believe in God. God gave me a vision right up front. I mean, like the week that I rededicated my life, God gave me an open vision during the middle of the night. It was like I was watching television. And it was about, uh, it gave me faith to hold on. And so it... it I'm not going to go into the whole vision, but I'm just telling you. I was wide awake. I couldn't sleep for days. But right there, saw this vision playing out, and that was something for me to hold on to waiting. Um, then um, I got through 22 months of it, strong in faith, believing, trusting, and going through all this ups and downs and terrible things and I was leaving, I mean, I had a blowout on the side of the road, and I said, don't y'all leave church, I'm going to be there, I call in, I'm having problems, but I'm going to be there, now I was at the very end, y'all don't leave, don't leave, I'm coming, <laughs> and I, I made it, <laughs> but I was leaving church, and Pastor Lyle, you know, shaking everybody's hand, and I was having a rough day. 
this was not that day, but this was a little past that. And I was, I was starting to get angry with God. 22 months in this battle. Although I was letting him, he was doing the fighting, it, I didn't seem like it, it wasn't happening because I was believing that my husband was going to come home because I didn't want a divorce. And I just had the faith, it's going to happen, it's going to happen. And well, 22 months later, I was getting angry. It was like, it's still not happening. So Pastor Lyle says, well, how, you know, how you doing, Kim? I'm, I'm not doing good. <laughs> well, you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. <laughs> Yes, well, you know, I was having a tough time, and he was encouraging me like he's supposed to do. He's giving me the word, what the word says. I said, I can't take any more of this. You, you can do all things through Christ, and I, I, I've, I've had it. I can't, I can't take any more. He won't give you any more than you can handle. I finally said, well, I won't take any more. I'm, I, I was angry, but I went home, I, real, I prayed, and I realized I was at the fork in the road. I was, my grace had run out. I got to the point where I, that's not what I wanted anymore. So I knew that I was, if I kept on wanting David to come home, then I was choosing him over God. And I just, I had to make the decision. I had to choose God. And I said, okay, Lord, I choose you. Let's get this over with. Three weeks later, my divorce was final, just like that. After two years of believing, trusting, and going through it. But anyway, and then um, that was in January of 2002. And then March of 2002, James started coming to the church. And so God just moved um, on that. And even Brother Ricky, he, he's like, Kim, you be encouraged because God's going to bring you a godly man. <laughs> And so, and he did. And so, um, even though James had a past, we all have a past. Uh, one of the first things early on, I mean, James gave me a note and said he would bless him to call me sometime. And I told, he was already gone before I even saw the note. And I told Paula, you, you tell James that I'm praying about the person that God has planned for me. And blah, blah, blah. And I finally, I was like, well, you just t give him my number and I'll tell him that. So anyway. Long story short, you see what happened. Um, <laughs> uh, 